to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Jesus said to the Father, I pray that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe you sent me. John 17, verse 20 and 21. We welcome you to our study of the Gospel of John. In today's lesson, we're going to be looking at John chapter 16 through 18. And so we encourage you to please get your Bible and be following along as we're going to study the Word of God together. As you find your Bible, we also want to remind you that today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Lord's Church. Christians in your community would love for you to stop by and visit their assemblies. Uh, the church would love to have you come by for a Bible study, or if you'd like to visit one of their worships, they'd love to have you as an honored guest in their service. Also, at the Gospel of Christ. We'd love to help you with any Bible study question that you may have as well. We're offering all of our DVDs and CDs. All of our lessons are available free of charge. You can download them from our website or we will send you a free DVD or CD of the video and audio as well. And if you've got a question, maybe something you've been struggling with or thinking about, we'd be happy to study with you. Just write to us or email us or call us. We'd be glad to help in any way that we can in your study of the Word of God. As we think today about John chapter 16 through 18, we're now entering in into some of the last moments in the life of our Lord and Savior as He is going to prepare His disciples and prepare all future followers with the teaching and the knowledge they'll need to make it to heaven. In John 16, Jesus is now going to teach that to keep His disciples from stumbling, they have been given the Word of God, which will help them overcome the challenges and the difficulties. Look at John 16, verse number 1. Jesus says to His disciples in this chapter, These things I've spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. Why did Jesus deliver the teaching that He did? Why did He tell His disciples these things? He said, I'm telling you this so that it'll keep you from stumbling. You see, God doesn't want me to fall. God doesn't want me to go by the wayside. God wants me to be saved. Psalm 119, verses 10 through 12, the Bible says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Do we see the value of God's word in keeping us from tripping or falling spiritually? As Peter was told in Luke 22, 31, Simon, Simon, Satan desires to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you. The power of the Word of God has that ability to keep us on the straight and narrow path. God's Word is living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. As I study my Bible, as I put that Word of God which is powerful into my life, as I store that knowledge in my heart, and as I try to live it out in my life, it has the ability to keep us from sin. Someone rightly said, either the Bible will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from the Bible. I believe that's exactly right. And Jesus told us, don't let sin keep you from the Bible. If you put your word in my heart, it will keep you from stumbling. The word of God has everything we need to help us be profitable as servants of God today. But friend, as you think about some teachings we find in John chapter 16, 16 one of the things we definitely learn is that sincerity alone, being sincere alone, is not enough. Jesus teaches us that sincerity without truth won't do you any good. And friend, before we even look at the verse, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of sincere people in the world. There are a lot of people who have a, a sense of sincerity, want to do the right thing, but you've got to combine that sincerity with truth. 
Let me show you. Look in John chapter 16. I want you to notice what the Scripture says in verse number 2. The Bible says these words. They will put, Jesus said to his disciples, they'll put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think he offers God service. Now, are these people sincere? You bet they are. They think that by killing Christians, they're actually doing God a favor or a service. They've got sincerity. They've got it to the extreme almost that they're willing to murder people they think are enemies of God. But you know what their problem is? They don't have truth. They're working on a misguided principle. They have sincerity, extreme sincerity, but not truth. Friend, there are people around the world who have this same idea and mindset today. You know, when I think of John 16 too, I think of people involved in the Islam faith who will strap bombs to their bodies and go out in a crowd and blow themselves up thinking that they're doing Allah service. Well, friend, that's not what we're taught in the Bible. And that's not what true love and care for other people is. And Jesus taught us here, sincerity has got to be combined with truth for it to be profitable. You see, Paul was along these same lines. He was in this same boat at one time. He describes it this way in Acts 23.1. Paul said as he's being put on trial, he said, Men and brethren, I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day. What did Paul mean there? In Acts chapter 6, when he's debating Stephen, or when he's there, uh, in Acts chapter 6 and 7, when he's uh, debating Stephen, and when Stephen is stoned, he's holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen. Did Saul think he was doing right? I've lived in all good conscience. In Acts 8, when he's dragging men and women out of their houses, and when he's wreaking havoc on the church, was Paul sincere? I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day. In Acts 9, when he's got official letters to, if he finds any of the way, that he can put them in prison, possibly some of them be put to death, did Paul, was he sincere? Did he think he was doing right? I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Paul was sincere, but he was sincerely wrong. And Paul admitted that in Acts chapter 23, verse 1. It's not enough just to be sincere, to be convicted. You've got to be convicted of truth. And you've got to be sincere about what's right. Paul would save his own brethren in Romans 10, verses 1 and 2. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. You see, there's a way that seems right. The end thereof is the way of death. Proverbs 14, verse 12. And so I want to make sure that not only I'm sincere, but I'm sincerely following the truth and that I'm doing what God wants me to do because there's a lot of people who do things out of sincerity, but not according to the Bible. And so let's make sure we're sincere about the truth. In John chapter 16, we also learn that, that today Christians have been, here's the good news, we talk about being sincere and sincere about the truth. The good news is we have that truth and we have all truth today. It doesn't have to be left up for debate. I don't have to wonder or, or guess or think that I may or may not be doing right. God's given us all truth and we have that today. How do I know that? Look at the words of Jesus in John 16, verse 13. What a great passage this is. Jesus says, concerning His promise about the Holy Spirit coming, Jesus says, however, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. Here's the promise Jesus made to His disciples. The Spirit of truth, the Comforter's coming. When He comes, He's going to guide you into all truth. He's not going to make it up. Whatever He hears is going to come directly from the throne of God, as it were. Friend, the promise was made to the disciples in the first century that they would receive all truth. Well, did the Spirit come? You bet it did. In Acts chapter 2, Luke 24, Jesus told His disciples, you, you go in Jerusalem, you wait for the Spirit to come from on high, you'll be endued with all power. In Acts chapter 2, they're there in that upper room and the Spirit descends upon them. Peter stands up with the eleven and they begin to speak by the power of the Holy Spirit for the very first time, the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Did the Spirit come? You bet He did. And they were promised He would receive, they would receive all truth. And friend, here's the good news. That truth they received, they wrote down in the Bible. 
and we have all truth revealed today. Jude 3 says this, Jude says, Beloved, well, I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, now don't miss this, which was once for all delivered to the saints. We have that faith that was once for all time delivered to the saints. And friend, the Bible tells us, the New Testament tells us, we have that truth, everything we need to get to heaven. Second Peter 1 verse 3, God has given to us, listen to this, listen, all inclusive nature now, God's given to us all things. Some? No. A few? Most? No. All things that pertain to life and godliness. Psalm 119 verse 160, all of God's commandments are righteousness. The Bible teaches us there that we, the entirety of God's word is truth. John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. The truth will set you free. John 8, verse 32, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is complete. There we go. When you think about the promise of John 16, 13, friend, we have God's final truth today. We have what we need to be saved. It was given during the first century and we're not looking for more than all. We've got all truth and everything we need to be right with God today. Then in John chapter 16, Christians, as we follow Christ, as we live according to His teaching, and as we pray, we're commanded to ask for God's help, His mercy and His forgiveness through the avenue of prayer, but there's a specific way in which we're taught to pray. Look at John 16, verse 23 and 24. Notice what Jesus says about prayer. Jesus says, and in that day, you'll ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Now, of course, you understand Jesus is saying to his disciples, I'm going away. I'm not going to be here for you to look me in the face and ask me something. When you ask and when you pray to the Father, if you ask in my name, I will do it. Prayer is in the name, by the authority, through the power of Jesus. John 14, verse 13 and 14. First Timothy 2, verse 4, The God who wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, He's also made one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus Himself. This is why Jesus said, Pray, our Father who art in heaven. Prayer is directed to God, directed to the throne of God. Hebrews 4, 16. But it's through the authority of power and name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And friend, as we think about powerful teachings in John 16, one of the greatest, one that I think ought to encourage every Christian so much is that Christians can overcome the world. Now I know Satan's doing his best. I know the world is pulling at each one of us. It's tempting. It's alluring us. It's as though it's trying to get its hooks in us. The good news is Jesus has taught us we definitely can overcome this world. Look in John 16, verse 33. Here's what Jesus said at the close of this chapter. Jesus says in verse number 33, These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble or tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Jesus teaches us since He overcame the world, we can overcome as well. Friend, I've never been promised that life is going to be free of problems. In fact, 2 Timothy teaches us that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But Jesus said, yeah, in the world you're going to have trouble. Be of good cheer. Be encouraged. I've overcome the world. And friend, you can too. I can overcome the world because I'm a Christian. 1 John 5 verse 4, this is the victory we have even our faith, victory over sin and Satan in this world. He who, listen to this now, 1 John 4 verse 4 is the key to overcoming the world. He who is in you is greater than he who's in the world. Who's in the Christian? God, Christ, who's in the world? Satan and sin. Who won that ultimate battle? Hebrews 2.14 tells us, Jesus through death overcame whom had the power of death and has released those who all their lifetime were subject to bondage. Jesus on the cross defeated the devil 
If Christ is in you, you can overcome Satan in the world just as well. What a powerful teaching that is. Revelation 2 verse 10, we can overcome by being faithful until death. Now friend, as we think about the gospel teaching, uh, the teachings in the gospel of John, especially in this section, there's another great lesson to be learned and that is all men are amenable to Christ and His law. Whether I'm a Christian or not, one day I'm going to be judged by God. I'm going to give an account to my Creator. Jesus clearly taught that in John 17 verse 2. Listen to these words. Why should all men obey the gospel? Because one day you're going to give an account to the Creator, like it or not. John 17, 2, the Bible says, Jesus speaking, as He prays to the Father, as you've given Him authority over all flesh, that He should give eternal life to as many as you have given Him. How many people does Jesus have control or authority over? Well, Jesus prayed to the Father, you've given the Son authority over all flesh. All men everywhere will one day stand before the throne of God. Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. Matthew 28, verse 18. He is the creator of all mankind. Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27. God said, let us make man in our image. The Lord God breathed, uh, created man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living being. He is the Father of our spirits. Hebrews 12 verse number 9, and thus I will, all men everywhere, will one day stand to give an account before God. As you think about these ideas, Jesus also teaches us some very powerful lessons that help us to want to live the way God wants us to and to be encouraged to live according to the teaching of the Scriptures. One of those is, as Christians, We've got to realize that although we're in the world, we're not of the world. That is, we may plant our feet on this soil, but our roots are not here. Let me give you the example. John chapter 17. Look at what Jesus said in verses 9 through 11. Jesus said, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All are mine and yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. Now I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you've given me, that they may be one as we are. Yes, we're in the world. Friend, I'm not to be of the world. I may live here. I may call this home for a few years. We may all have some pleasures and joys in this world, but it, the world doesn't need to be what I'm really of. Colossians 3 verse 1 teaches me that. If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. James 4 verse 4 teaches us the danger of becoming in and of the world. James says adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God, separation with God? Whoever therefore desires to be a friend of the world makes himself God's enemy. And listen to the warning of John in 1 John 2 verse 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. For all that is in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it's not of the Father, but it's of the evil one, and the world and all that's in it is one day passing away. But he who does the will of God, that's the one who will abide forever. Don't love the world. Why? Because this whole world and everything in it is one day going to pass away. 2 Peter 3, verses 9 through 12. And so while I plant my feet on this soil, I don't want my roots to get here. I want my roots to be in heaven, and that's where I really want to make my citizenship at in Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21. Now, as Jesus prays for His disciples in John 17, here's what He does. He prays for His immediate disciples that they can overcome Satan, deliver them from the evil one, Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13. But then Jesus also prays for all Christians to be unified, to have unity in who they are. Look at the words of John 17, verse 20 and 21. Jesus says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their words, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be, may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Well, what does God want for His followers? Friend, God wants us to be one. 
to have the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Psalm 133 verse 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. God doesn't want division and strife and fighting and schisms in the body. God wants us to be one. D division and denominationalism is contrary to that idea. 1 Corinthians 1 verses 10 through 13, Let there be no divisions among you. You see, there's one truth, and that's God's Word. There ought to be one church, Ephesians 4 verse 4, one baptism, one God, one Father, one hope. All those things are mentioned in Ephesians 4, and that's God's design. Has a man muddied the waters? Friend, you know he has. With all the division, the lack of unity, with a host of different religious groups, each teaching a different way to salvation. Friend, that's not what God intended. What does God want? He wants us to go back to the Bible. He wants us to strive for unity and to do what His Son taught us to pray for, to plea for, and to be a part of a unified movement. Now, in John chapter 18, moving forward, we're now going to enter into the, where Jesus is taken, where He's taken captive, where He's put on trial, where He is eventually going to be crucified, where He's going to die, and then be resurrected. But as you enter into John chapter 18, we're now going to see Judas betray Christ. Look at John chapter 18. I want you to notice beginning in verse number 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, He went out with His disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which He and His disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed Him, also knew the place. For Jesus often met with His disciples, often there met with His disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing, that, knowing things that would come upon Him, went forward and said to them, Who are you seeking? They answered Him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am He. And Judas, who betrayed Him, also stood with them. Now when He said to them, I am He, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then He asked them again, Who are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am He. Therefore, if you seek Me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which He spoke of those whom you have given Me. I have lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, struck the high priest, Servant cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword in the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my Father has given me? You know, when you think about Jesus' betrayal here, Judas played an important part in that. We already know from John chapter 12 that he was greedy. We know from John 13, Satan entered his heart. Now the high priest offered him these 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus, the one whom I kiss, he is he. Jesus identifies himself. In the other gospel accounts, uh, Judas kisses the Lord, and he there betrays him. And yet all of this was right in line with what was supposed to happen. Jesus was going to be betrayed. He was going to stand before Pilate. He was going to acknowledge the claim that he is the Christ, and he was ultimately going to die for the sins of the world. And so when I think about, when I think about this text, and when I think about all that, that Judas did, I think about what Jesus suffered for me and you. Look at the Lord going, allowing men to bind His hands. Jesus going before an evil government to be accused for what? Doing wrong? No, for helping the poor, healing the sick, feeding the hungry, casting out demons the most innocent person to ever live, was put on trial for crimes he never committed. In fact, he was put on trial, really, for crimes and sins that I had committed. And he will bear my sins, and he'll bear yours, ultimately, on the cross. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be mocked. They're going to spit in the face of Jesus. They're going to strike him with the fist. They're going to place that crown of thorns on his head. They're going to put that purple robe on Christ. A uh, cat of nine tails, a whip is brought across Jesus' back over and over again until eventually His hands and feet are nailed to a cross and He dies in agony for me and you. Why did Jesus do all that? Because Jesus loved me and you that much. Now in John 18, there is one question that I'd like for you to notice with me and it's found in verse number 38. Jesus is before Pilate. 
Jesus is discussing His kingdom. He identifies Himself as a king. But notice in John 18, verse 38, what Pilate said. Pilate said to Jesus, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in Him at all. What is truth? Great question that Pilate put forward. Jesus had identified He was truth. His teaching was truth. His kingdom was truth. His rule as king was ultimate and true. Pilate, what is truth? Friend, there's a lot of people who are confused as to what truth is. Let's be clear. God's Word is absolute truth. John 17, verse 17. Jesus Christ Himself is truth. The truth is in Jesus. Ephesians 4, verse 21. God is the source of all truth. Psalm 31, verse 5, and the words of the Holy Spirit, which we have in the Bible, they're defined as the Holy Spirit's words of truth. John 16, verse 13. One question then remains. In view of everything that Jesus did and taught, will I obey the truth? Will you obey the truth? Will we submit to God's truth and become Christians, followers and upholders of that truth? Friend, maybe you've never become a child of God. In view of what Jesus did for you, why not become one? Don't you want to go to heaven? Don't you want to one day live with God? Don't you want to put a, a life of sin and sorrow and trouble behind you? Have peace and joy and, and real happiness in your life? Don't you want help from above to overcome all the struggles and difficulties we face? Then if so, you need to obey Jesus and do what He said. Jesus said it this way, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe will be condemned. Do you believe in Jesus? Are you willing to change your life and turn from sin? Would you confess Him as your Lord and Savior? And would you be baptized to be saved? Our hope and prayer today is that each of us will strive to look for and live for the truth every day that on that final day we can hear these words, Well done good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of your Lord. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at one 855 458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788 McMinnville, Tennessee 37111 This is the Gospel of Christ